Hi guys, sorry for the delay. This will be the longest video I've ever recorded, and I'm sure you'll understand by the end what a bugger it was to research. Before we begin, I would like to slip in a few disclaimers if that's okay. I know I told you in my last video that I could vouch for my own Wikipedia page, but turns out I was wrong, because a particularly nasty bit of conspiracy mongering had been hiding near the bottom for the better part of a month, and I only found it by accident after I posted the video. It's gone now, but I haven't been able to get that page protected. If any of you saw it, please let me reassure you, there is nothing suspicious whatsoever about the death of Robert Sutton Harrington. And trust me, we will be covering that, just not in this episode. We still have a few centuries to get through before then. Secondly, this video, of necessity, features a great deal of French, and I don't speak French. So please, any Francophones, bear with what I'm sure will be my garbled pronunciations. Finally, and arguably most important, the story of the discovery of Neptune is complicated, fractious, and incomplete, and many sources contradict each other. What you're about to hear is by no means the definitive account, but simply what I managed to glean after two weeks of research. So please take what you hear with a pinch of salt. Anywho, enough talking myself down. Please sit back and enjoy the show. William Herschel died in 1822, having graced our world for one of his planet's years, 84 Earth years. His epitaph reads, Colorum perupit clostra. He broke through the barriers of the heavens. In 1816, John Keats paid indirect tribute to Herschel in his poem On First Looking into Chapman's Homer, when he noted that reading Chapman's translation of Homer's works made him feel, quote, like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken perhaps the first ever literary reference to the discovery of a planet. Wider culture had at last embraced Uranus. In scientific circles, however, Herschel's planet was becoming exasperating. No matter what astronomers tried, Uranus refused to behave. Johann Bode, of Bode's Law, had performed the vital task now called precovery, tracking down earlier records of the planet in previously published star charts and managed to track the planet back to a 1690 recording by the esteemed astronomer John Flamsteed. In 1786, Austrian astronomer Alexander Fixel Milner, I believe I am pronouncing that correctly, incorporated Bode's pre-covered positions into a predicted orbit, or ephemeris, which initially appeared consistent with observations. Within two years, however, Uranus had wandered off its predicted track. Fixel Milner decided that Flamsteed's 1690 record of the planet had to be an error, so he excluded it. In 1790, French astronomer Jean-Baptiste Joseph Delambre calculated a new ephemeris for the orbit of Uranus that took into account the gravitational effects of Jupiter and Saturn. With these in place, the issue appeared resolved. By 1800, however, Uranus began acting out again. Astronomers' attempts to answer the riddle of Uranus's peculiar orbit were often, if anything, even more peculiar. One proposal was that the planet was hit by a comet, Keep in mind, this was before anyone knew what comets actually were. A massive impact might explain one shift in Uranus's orbit, but not the several that have been seen, unless it was being hit repeatedly. Another suggested that the solar system may be full of some strange, thick substance that had caught Uranus like a bee in tree sap, even though it appeared to have no effect on any other planet. A third possibility was that Uranus was being jerked around by a giant invisible moon, which would have had to have been as large as Uranus itself. Over the following decades, the error in Uranus's predicted orbit increased from 12 arc seconds, a 300th of a degree, to 30 arc seconds, a 120th of a degree, and the idea began to gain traction that Uranus was being tugged by the gravity of a still more distant planet. One early convert was Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel, the man who in 1828 finally saw the elusive stellar parallaxes for which Herschel had searched his entire life. By 1840, Bessel had begun to spread the word, and in 1841, the quest was taken up by a most unlikely knight-errant, a soft-spoken and tragically unassertive young man named John Couch Adams. John Couch Adams was born a farmer's son in the rural county of Cornwall, but word soon spread of his prodigious mathematical abilities, which gained him a place at Cambridge. By his final year, professors were taking bets that he would graduate senior wrangler, 
the top math student of the year. While Adams was taking the mathematical tripos, the daunting, days-long Cambridge maths exam, his examiners noted that he would stare at the questions without writing anything down, and then, having worked out the answers in his head, write them in one go. Adams not only graduated senior wrangler, but lapped the competition. After graduating, Adams fell under the wing of James Chalice, head of the Cambridge Observatory, and decided to apply his mathematical abilities to theoretical astronomy, in particular, solving the problem of Uranus's orbit. This was, to put it bluntly, a masochistic task. Until then, gravitational calculations had involved observing a planet and then deducing from its own and other orbits its gravitational effects. To do the reverse, to observe supposed gravitational effects and then from them construct a planet, was orders of magnitude more complicated, and some have argued that earlier theorists would never have attempted it. Nevertheless, Adams decided to try, and by 1845 had arrived at a position for a possible planet. He submitted his figure to Chalice, but Chalice was not one to set a historical precedent by himself. Searching for astronomical objects that previously only existed in mathematical theory is humdrum today, but was unheard of then. And so, seeking refuge in authority, Chalice handed Adams' tables to the then Astronomer Royal, George Biddle Airy. You could say that George Biddle Airy was exactly the kind of inspired, eccentric dragon hunter that would have leapt at the possibility of finding a new planet. But you would be lying through your teeth. Despite his name, Airy was a shockingly unimaginative and close-minded man whose sole astronomical goal seemed to be to lock the universe down to a comprehensible size. Casual observers might have described him as boring, but that word undersells the spectacular, obsessive, and downright unnerving heights to which Airy raised the art of drudgery. He signed, dated, and filed his ink blots, spent hours marking empty boxes as empty, and forced his subordinates to man their positions even on cloudy days when no work could be done, often patrolling the observatory himself to chastise slackers. In short, if William Herschel was precisely the right kind of eccentric to locate a new planet, Airy was precisely the wrong kind. He believed the Greenwich Observatory should stick to its remit of aiding in navigation and plotting the motion of the moon, and was certain that Uranus's orbital irregularities would eventually be linked to the gravity of Jupiter and Saturn. He even once sent an astronomer home for looking for new planets in his downtime. Whether Ares' intransigence ultimately cost his country the honor of discovering the eighth planet is still debated today, but there is at least one instance in which his disdain for the unknown cost his country dear. In 1842, he cut all government funding to an avant-garde engineering project he described as rubbish. That rubbish was Charles Babbage's analytical engine, a steam-powered, clockwork programmable computer that, had Babbage completed it, would not only have launched the digital age a hundred years early, but would likely have rendered the British Empire invincible and prevented both world wars. Airy had the half-completed prototype melted for scrap. If Airy was precisely the wrong kind of mind to find a new planet, then Adams was the wrong kind of mind to deal with Airy. Adams was a cripplingly shy man who found more comfort in equations than conversations, and whose idea of fun was calculating mathematical constants to 200 places. Most modern historians agree that had he lived today, he would have been diagnosed with an autistic spectrum disorder like Asperger's syndrome. When Airy asked Adams a very reasonable question regarding how his calculations accounted for the changes in Uranus's distance from the Sun, Adams failed to reply. Some speculate because he saw the question as trivial. Airy, on the other hand, considered it non-negotiable, and refused to search for Adams' planet. It would prove a fateful decision, because across the channel in France, another planet hunter was already on the search, and he was anything but shy. Like Adams, Urban Jean-Joseph Le Verrier was a supernaturally gifted mathematician born to a modest but respectable middle-class family. His father was a government official who sold his home to provide the funds for his son to attend university after he failed the entrance exam. Upon graduation, Le Verrier did not pursue astronomy, but instead became, of all things, a tobacco chemist, publishing his first paper on the chemistry of matches. In 1836, despite having no formal training in the subject, he applied for, and got, an astronomical teaching position at the École Polytechnique. Within two years, he had already published a paper on celestial mechanics. These two facts ably illustrate the defining traits of Le Verrier's character. Remarkable ability tied to overwhelming self-confidence. While that ability would serve him well throughout his life, the self-confidence would not as it frequently crossed the line into outright narcissism. Over the years, Le Verrier would gain a reputation as a mauvais coucheur, or bad bedfellow. In what would become arguably the most influential description of him, an acquaintance once said, 
I do not know whether Monsieur Le Verrier is actually the most detestable man in France, but I am quite certain he is the most detested. On the 1st of September, 1845, the director of the Paris Observatory, François Arago, suggested that Le Verrier direct his talent for celestial mechanics toward finding the planet that had supposedly been so tormenting Uranus. Le Verrier's search would last little more than a year, during which he would write 10,000 pages of mathematical notes. He started with the basics. He knew that the planet could not be too close, or its perturbations would have been more obvious. However, he also knew that it could not be too far away, or it would have to be so large to perturb Uranus that its gravity would be perturbing Saturn as well. He settled on a presumed distance of twice that of Uranus, in keeping with Bode's law, unaware that the planet, once found, would consign that pattern to the Curiosity Cabinet. His search drew on correspondence not only with Arago in Paris, but also Airy at Greenwich. By the 1st of June, 1846, Le Verrier was confident enough to announce two possible positions for the planet to an accuracy of 10 degrees. When, later that month, Airy demanded of him, as he had of Adams, an account of Uranus's change in distance from the sun, Le Verrier was only too happy to provide it. The old tables were simply wrong. He added, quote, It is, in fact, one of the considerations that must increase the likelihood of the truth of my results, that they scrupulously account for all aspects of the problem. Unquote. Upon learning of Le Verrier's search, the usually recalcitrant Airy gained a late burst of fire in his belly, and prodded Chalice to race to find that planet. It may have been a superfluous phantom as far as Airy was concerned, but he'd be damned if he let the French find it first. Chalice scanned the entire sky for two months, with Adams constantly redoing and refining his calculations, offering new positions. It's possible Chalice actually unknowingly glimpsed his quarry on the 30th of July and the 23rd of August. In any event, the search was for naught, because on the 31st of August, Le Verrier had zeroed in on the precise location of his long-sought planet. Surprisingly, despite Arago having pushed Le Verrier onto the planet hunt in the first place, his Paris observatory, encumbered by government red tape, refused to confirm Le Verrier's result. But Le Verrier had had enough of observatory directors, and in a move of signature bravado, wrote directly to Johann Gottfried Galle, an observational astronomer at the Berlin Observatory, bypassing the observatory's director, the famed astronomer Johann Franz Enke. Galle received Le Verrier's letter on the 24th of September, 1846, and was immediately excited. Grabbing a nearby student, Heinrich Darest, to check the star maps, Galla pointed the telescope at Leveria's coordinates and began calling out star positions. Yes, Dares confirmed, that one was on the map. So was that one. And that one. After less than half an hour, Dares turned to Galla and exclaimed the now immortal phrase, The star is not on the map! That same day, Galla wrote a breathless letter back to Leverrier. Monsieur, the planet whose position you had indicated really exists. Soon, confirmations of the planet's existence were flooding in from across Europe and Le Verrier, much to his satisfaction, was a national hero. Enka, initially flustered at Gala for going behind his back, was quick to be magnanimous. In a letter to Le Verrier, he wrote, quote, Permit me, monsieur, to congratulate you most sincerely for the brilliant discovery by which you have enriched astronomy. Your name shall henceforth be associated with the most glorious imaginable demonstration of the correctness of universal gravitation. I believe that these few words encompass all that a scientist's ambition could possibly hope for. Unquote. In what was to be the first of several effusions of obsequious praise for Le Verrier, Arago declared that Le Verrier had, quote, discovered a planet with the tip of a pen, without any of his instruments other than the strength of calculation alone, unquote. Le Verrier was awarded the Légion d'Honneur, and the Royal Society of London awarded Le Verrier their prestigious Copley Medal, the same that they had awarded Herschel for his discovery of Uranus. A bust of him was commissioned and placed in his hometown. But of course, things would never be that simple and controversy would dog this planet from the start. Le Verrier initially proposed the name Neptune for the new planet, and it was under that name that the science journals formally announced his discovery on the 30th of September. However, he later changed his mind and decided it should be named Le Verrier instead. François Arago evangelized this choice of name, talking up Le Verrier every chance he got. Some have speculated this was due to Le Verrier having discovered that Arago was having an affair with his wife, and threatened to make it public though this has never been proven. Regardless, reaction to the name change was fairly heated, particularly when Le Verrier began referring to Uranus as, quote, Herschel, a name rejected by William's son John, who was then president of the Royal Astronomical Society, saying that he didn't want his father's name on a planet. Thankfully for posterity, after much indecision, Le Verrier finally decided on his original choice of Neptune.
And then, of course, there was Adams. On the 3rd of October, John Herschel wrote a letter to the London journal The Athenaeum, which made Adams' work public for the first time. I've been unable to locate the exact quote, but apparently it insinuated that Leverrier's discovery was only confirmed when corroborated by Adams' calculations. When Leverrier, who had not a clue about Adams' work until then, read that letter, it's fair to say he did not take it well. When George Airy sent a very polite and gracious letter gently informing him of Adams' calculations, Leverrier exploded. The letter Monsieur Herschel has communicated to me is in very bad taste and fails to do me justice. What can be his motive? I can't quite understand him, especially when he descends to insinuations which I find mortifying. Of what use, therefore, is it for Monsieur Herschel to cry out before all of England that I was not good enough to deserve his confidence? How is it that the son of the immortal astronomer who discovered Uranus has the audacity to write that my calculations alone would not have given confidence he showed before the British Association? Why, the day after the discovery of my planet, does he not see that he brought into question his scientific judgment by placing under injurious suspicion a labor which in fact had been confirmed in the most spectacular manner? Turning on Adams, he wrote, Why would Monsieur Adams have kept silent for four months? Why wouldn't he have spoken from the month of June if he had something to say? Why wait until the object has been seen in the telescope? Aries' reply was kowtowingly apologetic and shouldered the blame for the secrecy saying that Adams had never provided information about the sun-distance question, and that without it he did not urge publication. The apology didn't help. Arago defended Leverrier's claim in public, and the French press spat apoplectic vitriol at the British, whom they justifiably believed were attempting to steal their planet from them. Their anger was understandable. France and Britain had spent much of the previous century, and a sizable portion of the previous millennium, at war, and were still uneasy neighbors. The resolution of this peculiar territorial dispute befell upon John Herschel, who, in awarding the Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal, granted Adams and Leverrier joint credit. Since the Society did not award joint gold medals, Leverrier and Adams were both awarded special, quote, testimonials. For his part, Adams viewed the discovery of Neptune simply as a chance to do more calculations. Any claims of his priority went straight over his head, when he finally met Le Verrier in 1847, they shook hands like old friends and immediately began chatting about the finer points of celestial mechanics. And that, for 150 years, was the story. Le Verrier, the triumphant master of the cosmos tarnished by his own vanity. Adams, the quiet, tragically modest man who couldn't speak loud enough to be heard. Airy, the hidebound bureaucrat who failed to see the wonder before his eyes. And Chalice the bumbling observer who missed the golden opportunity that Adams had afforded him. But something remained amiss. Airy and Chalice had always claimed that Adams's calculations were only 1.5 degrees away from Le Verrier's. But whenever anyone asked to check Airy's extensive records at the Greenwich Observatory Library, they were told they were unavailable. And then, sometime in the mid-1960s, the observatory's Neptune records vanished. For decades, the whereabouts of the Neptune file remained unknown. And then, in 1998, an archivist was going through the bequeathed records of Olin Yuk Egan, a recently deceased staff member at the Inter-American Observatory in Chile. Several years before, Egan had been the chief assistant to the Astronomer Royal at the Greenwich Observatory, but had left in a huff and scarpered to the Southern Hemisphere. It had long been suspected that he had, quote, borrowed the Neptune file to aid in writing short biographies of Airy and Chalice, and never returned it, though when asked he always denied it. Well, it turns out he did, because the Neptune file was found in a strong box in his house in Chile, and what it revealed cast a harsh light on poor Mr. Adams. Far from being just 1.5 degrees off, Adams's calculated positions were never closer than 4 degrees, and his constantly shifting positions for the planet ranged across 20 degrees of celestial longitude, which would go some way toward explaining why Chalice couldn't find it. It seems Leverrier was right all along. He truly was the one and only discoverer of Neptune. Regardless, it's too late. Thanks to the egalitarian souls at NASA, the hazy compromise engineered by John Herschel all those years ago has been written into the cosmos. When Voyager 2 passed by Neptune in 1989, it observed a number of faint, flimsy rings around the planet. One, the discoverers christened Arago. Another, they named Le Verrier. But the outermost and brightest ring, and the only one visible from Earth, is named Adams. Please do not think too harshly of Mr. Adams. 
He dedicated years of his life to the search for Neptune, and neither sought nor desired any recognition for doing so. Upon succeeding Chalice as the head of the Cambridge Observatory, he played an important role in promoting women's education at the school. Late in life, he was appointed Astronomer Royal, but remained purely interested in calculations, and was himself awarded the Copley Medal for his studies of the Moon's gradual retreat from Earth. But for us, this is where his story ends. Adams would hunt no other dragons in his career, and was happy to live the quiet, uneventful life of a Cambridge professor. Le Verrier, on the other hand, would have none of that. He had other dragons to hunt, and they resided not at the outer fringe of the solar system, but at its very heart. In 1854, Le Verrier succeeded Arago as head of the Paris Observatory, an appointment that would result in mass resignations, several firings, and at least one suicide. One such firing was the 20-year-old student Camille Flammarion, who had become a journalist and excoriate Le Verrier in the media. His descriptions of the conditions of the observatory under Le Verrier's leadership resemble a fascist state. Le Verrier would fire people at random, even against the wishes of the government. He denied those he disliked access to assistance, and even coal in winter. Charles Daverdoing, the artist who painted Le Verrier's first post-Neptune portrait, attempted to cast him in a more positive light, saying he was, quote, a good-natured fellow, very cheerful and good company. Though he did not make allowances for the age or stamina of his workers, he was never one to bite his tongue, and more than once laid his hands on someone. Translation, he worked his aged employees to the bone and committed verbal and physical assault. Eventually, a committee formed that recommended he be fired from his position. But in a strange twist of fate, he was reinstated just four years later after his successor drowned. Le Verrier's Scrooge-like obsession during this time, for which he so mercilessly rode his army of hapless Cratchits, was to construct the most accurate vision of the solar system ever seen. And to that end, he corralled his assistants into an assembly line of tabulations upon tabulations, determined to get the distances and masses right to the highest possible precision. Of all the planets, though, the one that obsessed him the most was Mercury. The innermost planet had become a fixation for Le Verrier long before he'd even dreamed of Neptune. His first ever astronomical paper had used the most up-to-date and accurate planetary tables of the time to show that the solar system, over long time periods, is unpredictable. To demonstrate this required hyper-accurate predictions of the future positions of the planets, and when, in 1845, a transit of Mercury occurred 16 entire seconds after Le Verrier had predicted, he took it as a personal affront. The universe had embarrassed him for the last time. With the fame and power that came with discovering Neptune, and the full resources of the Paris Observatory at his command, he returned to face his nemesis. Blood may spill, lives may break, but Mercury would make sense. What Le Verrier had uncovered was a slow backwards rotation of Mercury's entire orbit, called precession, that meant it constantly undershot its predicted position by a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. How tiny? Le Verrier estimated it to be 38 arc seconds per century, though more recent calculations place it at 46 arc seconds. To put that in perspective, that is one entire 88-day orbit of Mercury every 3 million years. The precession was minute. But it was there, outside the margin of error and the effects of the orbits of the other planets. It was a blemish Le Verrier would not stand. After his triumph with Neptune, he considered any discussion of Newton's laws being at fault, quote, unallowable, and concluded that, quote, a planet, or if one prefers a group of smaller planets circling within the vicinity of Mercury's orbit, would be capable of producing the anomalous perturbation, unquote. He considered the latter option more likely, as a fully-fledged planet would have been visible during a solar eclipse, and reasoned that transits of these objects may have been observed but mistaken for sunspots. He considered that the best chance to locate it would be an upcoming eclipse in 1860. As it turned out, he didn't have to wait that long, for in the spring of 1859, his passion ingloriously careered into the life of a quiet, unassuming fellow named Edmond Lescabeau. Edmond Modeste Lescabeau lived up to his middle name. He was a humble country doctor in a rural region of Augere, whose passion for astronomy had inspired him to construct, on his own time and with his own funds, a surprisingly capable observatory. During the transit of Mercury in 1845, he came to the same conclusion as Le Verrier, that an object the size of Ceres or Pallas may lurk within Mercury's orbit, and that its transits would make an ideal quarry for an amateur astronomer like him. 
It took him a decade to assemble the necessary tools, but by 1859, he was ready. On March 26, 1859, according to his notes, Lescabeau observed a small dot, about a quarter of the apparent diameter of Mercury, seemed to cross the solar disk for one hour and 17 minutes. Nine months later, after reading of Leverrier's suspicions, he sent a letter announcing his discovery to a Paris journal. Within 12 hours of reading it, Leverrier had arrived unannounced at Lescabeau's front door, demanding to see his observational journal. The poor man had little time to explain that he did not keep an observational journal before the interrogation began in earnest. When Leverrier learned that Lescabeau's chronometer only possessed a minute hand, he cried, What? With that old watch showing only minutes, dare you talk of estimating seconds? With admirable self-assurance, Lescabeau countered that he was a physician and was perfectly capable of counting pulses in seconds. Leverrier continued to press Lescabeau on every particular. One should have seen Monsieur Lescabeau, he is reported to have said later, like a gourmand after a good meal. So small, so simple, so modest, and so timid. After an hour, the feast ended, and Leverrier left confident that Lescabeau's planet was real. He even managed to ensure Lescabeau was handed the Légion d'honneur, which I'm sure he was happy to receive. Now realizing he was likely dealing with a single planet rather than a swarm of planetesimals, Leverrier decided the object needed a name, and by February 1860, he had the perfect choice the name of the Roman god of the forge and the cuckolded husband of Venus, a name well-suited to a blasted world in thrall to the furnace of the sun, Vulcan. But the planet Vulcan remained elusive. Sightings were reported from amateurs and professionals across the globe, but survey after survey failed to confirm them. When Leverrier died on 23rd of September 1877, 41 years to the day after the discovery of his planet, he remained convinced of Vulcan's existence, assured that all the failure to find it meant was that working at the boundary of theory and observation is hard. A year after Leverrier's death, an epic expedition of scientific and engineering superstars was launched to observe an eclipse in the still wild frontier town of Separation, Wyoming, which included Thomas Edison and Norman Lockyer, founder of the journal Nature and discoverer of helium. On that expedition, during the three minutes of totality, James Craig Watson, head of the Ann Arbor Observatory, thought he saw Vulcan, though none of the other great names present during the eclipse saw anything. Over the next 30 years, more searches for Vulcan would be carried out, but by the early 1900s, no one seriously believed in it anymore. But still, something was causing Mercury to precess. That was no illusion. So what was it? When faced with a dragon, or a mystery at the edge of your understanding, science offers only three possible answers. One, the dragon is really there. Two, you are mistaken. Or three, there is a fundamental flaw in your understanding of the universe. Science is a necessarily conservative discipline and views option three as the nuclear button, only to be used as a last resort. After all, you aren't about to throw out a perfectly good scientific model that explains hundreds or even thousands of observations just because of one anomaly. That's why the heliocentric model wasn't universally accepted until Newton published the Principia in 1687 and provided a scientific system that not only allowed for it, but required it. Those in Separation Wyoming scanning the velvet darkness for Vulcan didn't know it then, but they would play a part in the revolution to come. One of the superstars on that expedition was Simon Newcomb, who would go on to play a role in the Michelson-Morley experiment into the speed of light the preconception-shattering result of which would throw the entire Newtonian conception of gravity into doubt. The solution would arrive in 1915, when a patent clerk named Albert Einstein published his general theory of relativity, which would supplant the old conceptions with a new idea of gravity that accounted for its effects in extreme conditions. Conditions like, say, proximity to the immense gravity of the sun. When Mercury's motions were reconceived as being within an Einsteinian space-time gravity well, as opposed to the old Newtonian tug-of-war, they finally slotted neatly into place. To explain the illusion of Vulcan, we made an illusion of our concept of reality. But even with his death, Leverrier's task was not over, because measurements were suggesting that Neptune alone was not sufficient to explain the errors in the motion of Uranus, and that there had to be another planet out there still to be found. A planet that future generations would call Planet X. And we will finally be meeting it in the next episode.